Hi everyone, and welcome to the Talk They Hear You podcast, What Parents Are Saying, Prevention Wisdom, Authenticity, and Empowerment. This podcast is brought to you by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Talk They Hear You is a national prevention campaign that aims to help parents and caregivers talk to their kids about the dangers and risks of underage drinking and other drug use. In this podcast, we will hear what's working and what isn't, and what might be missing in our efforts to help kids navigate away from alcohol and other drugs. I'm Debbie Burnt, Director of Parent Movement 2.0, and I'll be your host for this podcast. As a reminder, the views expressed here are not necessarily those of SAMHSA or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Today, we are talking about opioids, and we'll hear two very difficult stories. I am joined by Ed Tiernan from an organization called A Song for Charlie. I'm Becky Savage of the 525 Foundation. They are both parents and their stories represent a progression in our country of the damage that opioids are doing to our families. I'd like to start by hearing your stories and then we can talk about what parents listening can do or how they can respond. So Becky, would you start us? Sure. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Um, and Ed, it's always a pleasure to, to chat with you as well. Our story started this summer on June 14th, 2015. My two older boys were attending graduation parties and were underage drinking at some point during their time there. Prescription pills were brought out and kids decided to experiment that night. There were a total of five overdoses from that party and two fatalities. And my two older sons, Nick, who was 19, and Jack, who had just turned 18, passed away the next morning. So, so you know, since that has happened, we've begun talking about it and doing advocacy work to try to bring awareness to this issue. Thank you. I can't, you know, I, I think you guys are both living a parent's worst nightmare. And I, I can't even begin to imagine what the next day and weeks and really ever since your life has been like. And we'll talk some more about that. Ed, do you want to tell us your part of this? Sure. Yes, I'm happy to share our story. And I really appreciate, Becky, you sharing yours. They're always difficult to hear. And sadly, they're getting more common, not less. My wife, Mary, and I lost our youngest son, Charlie, on May 14th, 2020. Charlie took what he thought was a Percocet that he acquired on social media. He took it on a, on a Thursday afternoon, so Charlie was not at a party. He was self-medicating for back pain and kind of trying to calm his nerves before a telephone job interview he had later that day. We know from his friends who were around the fraternity house where he was living that someone spoke to him about three o'clock in the afternoon and he never made the five o'clock phone call for the interview. So sometime between three and five, he took a single pill that he thought was a Percocet. And we found out later that it was not a Percocet. It was a counterfeit Percocet made of fentanyl. And that's what, that's what took his life. So you guys, so the... 2015 to 2020, and we know that there's an opioid crisis in our country, and it's been going on for many years now. And in the beginning of it, it seemed like it was more centered around true prescription drugs. So a Percocet, an opioid, and some of the others are Oxycontin, Vicodin, or some of the common brand names that you hear and that those have been for many years circulating through the teen and young adult party scene. And it sounds like, Becky, that's really what your sons encountered. And it sounds like they were also drinking. And I want to talk a little bit about the combination. But what I'm hearing from both of you is your children were not problem drinkers or users. We have parents who have kids that are actively using and they do have problems with that use and really are in more of that addictive kind of crisis space. It doesn't sound like either of you, your kids were in that space. Becky, if you would talk to us a little bit about the alcohol and how you think 
your kids got there? Well, I think, you know, kids are curious by nature. That's nothing we're ever going to cure. Kids are always going to be curious. And back seven years ago, when this happened, I'm an educator. I, I have a degree in nursing and I taught college level kids. And I really felt like I was kind of in the know what was going on. And we had those conversations with our kids about underage drinking, about illicit drugs and things that we thought being good parents, we were supposed to be having these conversations with our kids. Never once did it cross our mind about prescription meds because it just wasn't talked about. It just wasn't brought to the attention. We had no idea. And so I really feel like when it was in a teenager's pocket at a graduation party and it was brought out, kids were partying, the curiosity kind of took over. Could it have been peer pressure too? You know, I'm sure there's a little bit of that goes into with a lot of bad choices sometimes that kids make. But that was a conversation that we had never had with our kids. So they weren't prepared on how to respond to that. And they responded how they knew how to respond is sure, let's, let's try it. Or, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there, but you know, it's just, I think way back when seven years ago, but actually seven years ago, wasn't that long ago. And now to see where we're at with opioids, now it's turned into a fentanyl um, crisis. It's very scary how these meds and how these drugs are changing in our communities at a rapid rate. Completely agree. And the opioid drug can kill very quickly. It, it has that overdose component where it will shut down the central nervous system or the brainstem and breathing function and some of those you know, core bodily functions. And it can do that very quickly in an adverse reaction standpoint. If we fast forward to fentanyl, Ed, do you describe fentanyl in any specific kind of way relative to all other opioids? Is it X times stronger or how do you talk about it? Fentanyl is several times stronger. It's a hundred times stronger than morphine. And that's why in a medical environment, it's desirable in post-surgical anesthesia. And I, when I give my talks, I tell people that if you break a bone and you end up in the ambulance, the first responders will probably give you fentanyl. And when they do, you will say thank you because it is a very, very potent painkiller. It comes on very, very fast. Now that medical fentanyl, uh, the pharmaceutical grade fentanyl is not what's killing people. It's the illicitly made fentanyl that's being stirred up in basements and garages that is on the, that's flooded the street and is being pressed into pills. And that's what's killing people. And back to Becky's point, the real risk and what parents really need to understand is these opioids and now the fakes are both kind of seen by the kids as relatively safe. They're familiar and because, well, they're pharmaceutical and they come from a doctor. And so, well, okay, I'll try one. It's not like I'm doing hard drugs. And they, they don't understand the risk of mixing with other substances, just how powerful these, even the pharmaceutical versions can be. And now the even more potent fentanyl that's hidden in what looks like a familiar pharmaceutical. That's why we've got kids dying by the thousands is because of that fakery. And I think parents need to also understand that fentanyl from a street drug business perspective is one of the cheapest intoxicating substances that is being manufactured right now. And like you said, in all kinds of nefarious backyards, garages in our country, outside our country, coming into our country. And what that is doing is changing the entire street drug scene. If you are a street drug manufacturer, so an illegal or illicit drug manufacturer, and you are trying to produce or get out on the market Adderall or any of the benzodiazepines or cocaine or anything, there is a shift to those manufacturers just using fentanyl. Because if you think about it, they look at their consumers as wanting to get high and are they really that worried about what type of high they're selling? And so you even have the kids that are 
ordering Adderall off the internet because they want that focus thing that you get with the ADHD medicine or anxiety medication. There's a chance that it's just fentanyl and that's also contributing. Would you agree with that or would you add to that? I would add to that that this is a seismic shift in the drug landscape and it's not going to change. And fentanyl is sadly probably not the end in terms of new substances coming out. The shift is actually bigger than that. It's this movement from what we describe as from the farm to the lab. And Sam Quinones talks about this in his book, The Least of Us, that just came out. The manufacturing street drugs with synthetics rather than plant-based drugs is just a better mousetrap because it changes, as you said, the entire supply demand economics. If you wanted to get more heroin to the street because you thought consumers were, were wanting more, you're tied down to the yield of the opium crop in Afghanistan. If you want to provide more fentanyl and press more pills, you just add a night shift. And so when your supply is unlimited and you can meet demand as high as demand ever goes, then the price goes through the floor. Mm-hmm. And and then you combine this really cheap substance with its potency. It is an ideal raw material for drug traffickers. Now, when you talk about Adderall, they're manufacturing Adderall with methamphetamine. There are a new family of synthetic opioids called nitazines, which are even stronger than fentanyl. Again, this new business model is to find the most potent raw material you can, increase your batch yield so that a little bit goes as far as possible and it's all profit. So kids and parents need to understand that that is going to be with us forever. So understanding what's going on in the world of drugs has never been more important. It's really different now. And I think, Debbie, and add to your point is fentanyl is intentional. They are intentionally putting fentanyl in counterfeit pills, in marijuana that is out there on the streets, in vape containers, you know, the vape juice that kids are vaping. They are intentionally putting fentanyl in these products to try to make their product stand out more than the other drug dealer down the street so that these kids are going to get a better kick, a better quote unquote high when they use these products. And they're going to come back to that same person and use their drugs. So this is something that when I talk to kids, I tell them they are not regulated by the FDA. We do not know how much is going in this stuff. And unless you are getting it from a pharmacy, do not take a pill from anybody it's scary. It is very, it's that scary. And it has to be that cut and dry with kids because we are not talking about life and death choices right now. I, I don't know what I would say about the street drug world, but I, I do feel like it's just game off at this point in time. There, There's not a cocaine. There's not a methamphetamine. There's not anything that you could buy on the street today that you can trust as being what it says it is. Right. I was pulling up reports for another thing I'm working on and drug use in kids are actually going down, but overdose rates are going up. And the, what they're linking that to directly is the fentanyl. Fentanyl is in everything. And it's a very scary world right now. I think a report came out this week, in fact, that said the adolescent overdose rate increased by 94% between 2019 and 20. It's the number one cause of death right now in teenagers. And none of us as parents want to believe that our kids are walking out of our house and going to a party and might actually take a pill. I think you and I talked about this a little bit, Becky, that that's in the profile of risk-taking and that's in that adolescent development stage and it's brain development, neuroscience 101, that adolescents are wired to take risks and they're wired to feel invincible and we want them to. Because that's how we learn and we grow and we're not going to be able to change that. What we want to do is to bring them the awareness and educate them on what is out there so that when they are faced with those choices, that they're hopefully making a better choice and that their risk taking 
behaviors maybe are um, not as risky because of the education they have behind that or the awareness that they have. Hey, I can't go buy marijuana on the streets because I know that it could be laced with fentanyl and I'm not willing to take that risk. That's what we want. You know, it's a lot of it is harm reduction. When you think about it, we're not going to change those entities and kids and their behaviors, but we want to help help them not die. Kids should learn from their mistakes, not die from them. And I would add to that, Becky, that's really well said. When we talk to people about our mission to talk directly to young people, the other thing that research shows, especially in this modern information age with the internet and social media and all that kind of stuff, is that the adolescent mind wants to make independent decisions and not, the kids don't want to be told what to do. And so the best thing to do is, is present this, at, at giving them information that they can use to make better decisions. We say, just say no, but we spell it K-N-O-W. We want you to know that this is happening out there. We, and it's more important for you kids to understand the drug landscape all the risks are out there to really know that it is different. And if you just Google a little bit, you won't have to hear it from mom and dad. You'll see for yourself. This is really happening. And it's on you to get smart about it and protect you and your friends from this. It's, it's important that we find ways to communicate with kids that they relate to. And I agree with what Becky's saying. It's about giving them information because we think many of them, not all, but many of them armed with the right information will make a different decision. And in kids who died the way Charlie did, they did not ask for fentanyl. They asked for something else. So our message a little bit is that pill you see on Snapchat, that's not a Xanax. And the response we get is, thank you for telling me that. I didn't know that. I think as a parent myself, the idea that my kids might be ordering drugs off the internet is so, <laughs> I, I don't know, just disturbing, shocking. I need to pull my head out of the sand. I don't know what. Any other thoughts about how did we get here? You know, when, when did we move away from the pharmacy? And I, I don't know. Any thoughts about that? I have some. The internet and social media is where young people do all kinds of transacting and interacting. It's where they do all their social interacting. I think way too much. I think screen time has gotten out of hand, whether it's sitting in front of video games or Netflix or scrolling through TikTok. So drug traffickers will always find the, these are sophisticated marketers. Their business model is get illicit drugs to the U.S. public. And they will use whatever distribution channel is available. And in the early phase of the opioid crisis, when the pivot was made from diverted pills and people who were addicted to those pills moved to heroin, the state of the technology at that time was cell phones and pagers. And that brought black tar heroin off the street corners and it was delivered to people in parking lots because they would page their, their dealer and find a meetup. Social media is today's distribution channel. That's just the way it is. And kids get everything from pizza to pills on these social media apps. And they can connect with good people and good friends and also strangers and predators. So knowing what's going on with social media and these days for parents is really important. If your child has an app on that phone, you need to know how that app works. You need to understand the trust and safety policies how you report things. In the old days, we used to say you wanted to make sure you know your kids' friends or you know where your kids are. They'd leave the house and you'd want to know where they are. Well, you want to know where they are on social media too, as much as you can. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that so much of what's on social media is not real. And those are conversations we need to have with our kids too about what's real and not what's real. You know, kids are on social media and they're seeing what they think everybody else is doing whether it's using drugs or, or, or whatever. And it's kind of normalizing that a concept of drug misuse. We need to have those conversations with our kids too. A, know what they're doing on social media and kind of have those conversations, but also the conversation of what's real and what's not real. Those people who said that they've done this, these drugs, and it's the best feeling they've ever had might not be real. It could be a sales tactic as well. So those conversations need to 
be had as well. I just am always taken by how daunting parenting is today. There is no end to the number of things that we encounter as parents. I could give you a list of 50, you know, internet gambling, sexting, active shooters, nutrition, sunscreen, hydration, little things to these enormous things. And, and I know lots of times parents will kind of punt or kind of look away when it comes to the drugs and alcohol and to the partying because there's so many other things and it feels like maybe that's a place where they can be a little more permissive. But I think what I hear over and over again is parenting drugs and alcohol, we have to stay vigilant. And your stories are another reason why. Really, as a parent, helping a child say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to drink. You know, that's not going to be part of my high school life. I don't know. Any thoughts about that and you know, how to keep it active? I think a lot of parents maybe don't have the drug talk with their kids or have it as in depth with their kids because they don't think it's going to happen to their kids. There's still a lot of stigma wrapped around what somebody looks like, what the landscape looks like for somebody who is going to misuse drugs. And probably neither Ed's kid nor our kids fit that landscape. If you would go back and people did studies, they would never have pointed to our kids as being somebody who would be at a, a high risk for that. But we're both here with stories that are, are showing people it can happen to anybody. These are conversations that should be on the forefront of those conversations with kids. And another thing to talk with them about is not only why they shouldn't be doing drugs, but also give them a reason or an excuse. You know, when you're at a party and this is brought out, have those dialogues with your kids role play so that when they are in that situation, they know how to respond. It's no different than studying before you take a big exam. You know, when you do that, you're better prepared for that exam when you do take that test. This is no different when you're at a party and if you've rehearsed, have an exit plan or a, a code or something you're going to talk with your parents about that when that situation happens, because it's not if, it's when. When it happens, your kids are going to be better prepared. You're going to get that text message that says, I need to be picked up or something. And we all need to be teammates in drug prevention. And we need to help our kids with that. It's very hard, very hard, but we need to be their champions as well. Yeah, and I would add that it really is a tough time to be parenting. And <clears throat> long-term, I'm hoping we can pull back from the edge a little bit, even as a culture, because kids today are bombarded with all kinds of images that glorify the party life. You talk about studies, you know, when you ask kids today what they want to be when they grow up, the number one answer is YouTube influencer. And back in my day, it was fireman or astronaut. So the models that these kids are seeing online where everyone's life is beautiful and glamorous and full of limousines and rave parties and flashing lights needs to be countered at home somehow. You don't have to aspire to that. And long-term, the way life really is, as we understand as we get older, is life is not a party. That's not a, a long-term kind of sustaining way to go through your life. So that's a deep, deep conversation, right? I mean, but I think part of the issue and this glorifying and seeing all this wonderful stuff online all the time, I think is contributing to another factor, which is this mental health crisis among youth that we're going through. And increasingly, the kids who are dying from overdose or poisonings are not dying in party environments. They're dying at home in their bedrooms, in their own beds in their parents' homes, because what they're doing is just escaping, taking the edge off, easing some pain, relieving stress and anxiety. And so parents need to be alert for that as well those kind of behaviors, isolating, pulling away and, and have conversations with their kids about how they're feeling and let the young people know that and it's an easier conversation as we are kind of post COVID to say, look, you're probably feeling some stress and anxiety. 
all your friends are. We all are. Everyone's kind of feeling it these days. And that's okay. Make sure that you can talk to us and you can talk to others and we can get through this somehow. But the one thing you can't do, and we say in our talks, you can't solve real problems with fake pills. And although your stress and anxiety is real, these pills and substances you see out there online and at parties and so forth, they're not the answer. And in fact, they're more dangerous than they've ever been. So you have to take that solution off your playlist. And I think that goes along with the stigma. Kids are, maybe they are feeling those stress, anxiety and things, but they're afraid to tell somebody about that. So for them, it's just easier to get online and order something because then they don't have to tell anybody and talk to, to people. And we need to be talking about there is no shame and there should be no stigma related to having feelings like that because everybody has feelings like that at some point in their life. Yes. And there's no shame in that. And to talk to somebody about that and get help from real professionals who can help you and prescribe. If you need a medication, they can prescribe what you need, not a drug dealer making up a pill in their garage. And I think the social media glamour, everything's great picture or message that is out there is so opposite of what adolescence is. If you looked in the definitions, adolescence equals awkward. It is so uncomfortable, right? It is, you know, everybody's like, oh, middle school would never go back. High school would never go back. I mean, it is where we are supposed to be figuring out who we are and how to connect and what's important and what's not. And that is an excruciatingly painful process of walking into a room and feeling awkward and uncomfortable and making a decision to do something, whatever it is, crack a joke, go talk to a friend, whatever. And then you get all that feedback about, okay, I can walk into a room and here's my strategy and this is how I'm going to connect with people. I don't think we ever talk about that either in terms of just guess what? It's going to just suck for a couple of years and you just got to kind of you know, wade through it and it's going to get better. I think we're missing that one as well. Yeah, for sure. It, and it's okay. It's normal. And yeah. kids, that's what they want to feel is like they fit in with everybody else. Absolutely. They don't want to stick out. And what they need to realize is that it's okay. And we all feel like that. Yeah, it is part of the process. Any other thoughts that you guys have for parents? I know you both wish you had known and then had talked to your kids about you know these substances. Any other thoughts for parents listening? It's really important for parents to know what's going on out there. You know, stay up to date on what the new trends are. The trends in drug um, use are changing rapidly, but educate yourself and have a conversation with your kids. I've been asked before from kids, how do you have a conversation with your parents? And that was so sad and it really stuck with me. And so every time I talk with parents now, I'm like, Kids want to have those talks with you. They don't know how. So we need to educate ourselves and start those conversations with them. And we know that kids won't have a conversation with us if we don't know what we're talking about. So educate yourself on, on whatever the topic is, whether it be marijuana, vaping, prescription pills, social media, anything. Know the facts and, and have those short, quick conversations with your kids. All the time. I mean, I know my son, my youngest son, used to love the car rides to the icebox because he'd be on his phone, on his way to hockey practice, playing around. And then those conversations, that changed real quick until he got his driver's license. I used that time to talk with him about everything in the car. And he was very well prepared. You know, use that time wisely, parents. When you're with your kids, have a quick conversation with them in the car. I agree. I mean, we raised three kids, but it's not my area of expertise. But I agree completely. Parents need to be really up to date because the drug landscape is constantly shifting. It's moving very quickly. The emergence of potent synthetics is a trend that's here to stay. And it is more of a public health talk than the drug talk. It's more of a, you should know son, daughter, about this risk that you face that, frankly, I never had to worry about. It just it really is different now 
than when I was growing up. And I'm concerned for you. And so I encourage you to learn about what's going on. And I myself am keeping up with what's happening. And we should talk about that. And when I see an article or a new piece of information comes out, I'm going to share it with my kids. And I hope you'll come home and tell me what's going on in your world too about it. Because it's really, it's moving fast. We both need to stay on top of this. Great. And I think you both kind of said teamwork Mm. in a couple different ways. To be able to use drugs and alcohol as a way to get on the same team might be one of the opportunities in today's world. You know, whereas I think we've always been loggerheads about that with our kids in the past, but really kind of finding a way to craft a team approach to this topic is really powerful. I want to make sure our listeners are understanding the substances that we're talking about, because I know... I was confused at one point in time, heroin versus what, what is that? You know, so you have the prescription opioids that are in the Percocet, Oxycontin, Vicodin space. Heroin is an opioid that's um, manufactured on the street. Fentanyl is a really strong opioid that is, has both a way to get it through prescription. And then as we've talked about, it's coming through the street manufacturers rapidly And then we talked that that fentanyl can be added to other types of pills or just replaced and pressed and sold as a fake pill. And then it can also be, I think you've mentioned once, Becky, in marijuana. And and I think parents might be a little confused by that. And so wanted to clarify two things. It can be sprayed on marijuana plants. And we saw the first reported version of that in Connecticut last year. So that is happening. And also in the marijuana space, the THC from the plant has been pulled out and put in all kinds of concentrates, liquids and solid concentrates. And that's what kids vape and that's what kids dab. And fentanyl can be very easily added to those types of compounds. So Ed, do you want to tell us about your latest project? Right. My organization, which my wife, uh, Mary, and I founded, is called Song for Charlie. And we're very honored to play a small part in an event that's coming on May 10th of this year. It's called National Fentanyl Awareness Day. There's a website. It doesn't use the national. So it's fentanylawarenessday.org. This is being put together by a very broad and diverse coalition of people from all three main stakeholder groups in um, in the drug conversation. That's people in supply reduction, demand reduction, and harm reduction. And we have a very diverse advisory council of uh, subject matter experts that have come together and a number of very high profile corporate partners and advocacy groups, including Google and Shatterproof organizations from all over and CADCA and, and others. And the idea is that it's a virtual event and there will be a lot of activity on social media around it on the 10th of May. And the ask is very simple. It's go to this website. We've posted six facts about fentanyl on the website and we're asking people to pick one and share it on social. It's very easy. And our corporate partners are, what they're doing to really help is they're putting out internal emails about the day and the new dangers of fentanyl in America, mostly through their human resources departments to all their employee nationwide. So we're really trying to just make a big splash on a single day and just make it so that everywhere anyone turns on May 10th online, you're going to hear, oh, today's National Fentanyl Awareness Day. And people will learn a little bit about this issue on that one day. So powerful. As we've talked this whole time, the the lack of awareness is just staggering, giving... The, the potential harm and outcomes. So it sounds like a brilliant effort and I really appreciate that you guys are doing it and I'm and very happy to be able to talk about it today. Excellent. Any other thoughts in demand reduction feels like a parenting space. Any other thoughts at, along those lines or in general before we sign off? I would say that when when I think about parents, we give presentations to students and also to parents. And the tactic that we've taken, my wife and I, and what we're trying to do is that this is a very big and complex and rapidly changing issue. And we live here out in the West, and I use the analogy of 
like the scenario where we have wildfires here in the West. And there's those situations where the fire chief calls the mayor of the town and says, the fire is between us and you. And we, the authorities, are doing everything we can to catch up, but it's a very fast-moving fire. And so until we get there, you need to take care of yourselves. You need to get together and protect your town and your citizens and pull everyone together. That's kind of our message about this. It's going to take a while for us to catch up to this new problem of potent synthetics and counterfeiting. The intersection of those two things is new and earth-shaking. And until we figure it out and until help arrives, it's up to families and parents and teachers, and school districts, and, and just all of us individuals to figure this out ourselves and just protect one another from these risks. And that really all starts with awareness. I agree. I think what parents can do as far as prescription medications so that they don't end up in a teenager's pocket at a graduation party is so simple. Just go clean out your medicine cabinet. If you have expired medications in there or medications you're not using anymore, clean out your medicine cabinet, dispose of them in you know, at local take back locations. The DEA, I know they have a national take back day they, that they do twice a year, but get them out of your house so that they're not falling into the wrong hands. And then talk to your kids. Those two things could sound so simple, but they could actually save a life. Both of you, those were brilliant remarks for us to end on. I appreciate your perspective so deeply and I'm so grateful that we've gotten to have this conversation, this very sobering conversation. So I want to thank you very much and remind our listeners that the Talk They Hear You materials, including this podcast, can be found on the Talk They Hear You website, which is talktheyhearyou.samhsa.gov, all spelled out. Please share this site and this podcast with your friends. As we've talked about today, the more we can be in conversation with each other, the better for everyone, especially our kids. And we would like to hear from you. Listeners, would you like to be on our show? Do you have stories that you want to share or tips or techniques that have worked or not worked as you've parented? Do you have questions for us or any feedback on topics or improvements of any kind? We know that your input will help us design the most useful interviews possible. For any of this, please contact us at whatparentsaresaying at gmail.com, which are all of those words spelled out, what parents are saying at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.